Good morning, everyone. I am Meredith Baker, and on behalf of CTIA and the entire wireless industry, I want to give you a warm welcome. You know, we spend a lot of time in D.C. talking about 5G and the next generation of wireless. It will transform our lives, make us safer, with landmark advancements in healthcare, energy, and transportation. One example, 5G will save 20,000 lives on our roads alone every year. That's remarkable. But the promise of 5G depends on safe and secure mobile experiences. As our world becomes more connected, wireless industry works tirelessly to protect our consumers and our networks. But for very good reasons, we don't often talk about our cybersecurity efforts or the hundreds of millions of dollars that are invested to thwart cybersecurity bad actors. With a new Congress and a new administration, it seemed timely to bring together the industry experts and the policy leaders to help talk about the most important thing of our shared priorities, keeping Americans safe. Our goal on this event and with the white paper that we released this morning is to highlight the cybersecurity efforts of the entire mobile ecosystem. By fostering stronger ties between government and private sector experts, we can facilitate a more collaborative approach. Wireless will soon connect everything. There are already more wireless devices than Americans. And with the rise of the Internet of Things and smart cities and connected, connected everything, the need for a secure and a reliable network grows by the day. I'm confident that the wireless industry is up for the challenge because we have a culture and a track record of constant innovation. We can all easily recognize how wireless service improves every year in speed and capability. Think about the basic analog voice service in your first G to today's state-of-the-art 4G LTE networks. The thing you don't see is the impressive cybersecurity leaps that we make. Each new generation brings significant enhancements to the security of your network, your device, and your experience. So 5G will be no different, and I'm excited that the leading industry voices are here today to talk about what's next. But keeping us safe is not something that our industry can do alone. Everyone has a role to play. First, consumers can help secure their wireless experience. It is incumbent upon us to help empower them with both the tools and the education to protect their own mobile experience. I'm proud to report that consumers' use of wireless security features continues to rise year to year. Five years ago, only 50% of Americans used the security tools on their smartphone. Today, that number is nearly 80%. More than three quarters of Americans run software updates regularly on their smartphones. We have more work to do, and we are committed to making sure that our consumers do more. The other key partner is government, and I stress the word partner. For us to succeed, we need the government to be a collaborative partner, helping us stay ahead of cyber threats and bad actors. The NIST framework remains a sound approach and one that pays dividends. I'm encouraged that the new administration and Congress are stressing better ways to share information and collaborate. In the recent years, we have risked shifting towards a more command and control regulatory approach that would have had the unintended consequences of hindering our ability to respond to cyber threats. I believe we need to recommit to finding more ways to share information. This is key with full and appropriate liability protections for all players to do the right thing. We are ready to invest and help lead the effort. In doing so, we need to identify the right partner for future collaboration. 
I share the view of Chairman McCall, who we're lucky enough to have with us this morning, that the right approach is to empower DHS to be the private sector's cyber partner. And I'm delighted that DHS Undersecretary Manha is here today with us as well. But before we begin, I want to thank you for being here. And I want to thank our speakers and exhibitors, as well as our cyber working group. I also want to thank our own cyber experts, Tom Swanabori and John Marino, for helping organize this event today. I'm excited to hear about everything our first speaker has to tell us and get this per perspective of a key voice in keeping Americans safe online, the FBI. Ronald Yearwood is the FBI's Cyber Division Chief and brings almost 20 years experience and expertise to our conversation. I'm looking forward to his take on the global cyber landscape. So please join me in welcoming Ronald. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to provide some comments at the opening of the 2017 CTI Cybersecurity Summit. Uh, we greatly appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here at the intersection of innovation and the inception of wireless evolution. In these few minutes that we share this morning, at the, uh, I'd like to impart upon you a, a few specific thoughts on areas uh, of interest I think that we all share. So we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk briefly about wireless growth and vulnerabilities, the cybersecurity landscape, FBI efforts in this space, and then the future of security in this space. So just as a, a, a quick note, uh, all of the comments that I make are the opinions of Ron Yearwood. This is not an official statement on behalf of the FBI. These are all off-the-record comments, but um, I just wanted to get that out of the way. So wireless technology is, exceptionally, is an exceptionally timely topic in the cyber arena. The explosion of advancement and digital expansion in our global society is nothing short of revolutionary. Uh, in studying the CTIA website, there are some statistics I wanted to use to highlight this. Uh, 377.9 million wireless subscriber connections or active devices uh, on the net. 49.3% of U.S. households are wireless only, having no direct connection back into the network. 93% of Americans have four or more wireless uh, provider choices. Um, between 2005 and 2013, the cost per megabyte of data decreased by 99%. And data usage growth from 2013 to 2015 went from 3.2 trillion megabytes to 9.65 trillion megabytes. And there's an expectation that there will be 1.5 billion Internet of Thing devices in use by 2022. The wireless propagation has saturated our personal and professional lives, embedding mobile technology in previously untapped areas while providing for the inauguration of a new category of advancement called the Internet of Things. Paired with the groundbreaking, uh, with the advent of lightning fast 5G network speeds, the future truly lies in the stars. These groundbreaking advancements in technology generate palpable energy, driving the innovation and inspiration of new generations of technologists. And what an invigorating place to be at this summit and how exciting it is for all of us to be alive during this time, this dynamic period of human history and digital advancement. However, to truly leverage and exploit the extraordinary potential of wireless technology development, we must also discuss security. For, for with each and every advancement, new security threats arise to challenge our efforts. Regardless of the noble intentions of developers, individuals who would use these emerging technologies for nefarious purposes, nefarious intent, are equally as steeped in the expertise we would use to advance our ambitions. Security is not always built into the infrastructure, facilitating our advancing mobile technology. Although proximity limitations remain a challenge for our adversaries, uh, for the adversaries of safe wireless development, a number of instances have recently been noted where this challenge was surpassed, prompting highlight, hi heightened awareness of physical security requirements. As we have participated in and been witness to the vibrant developments in wireless technology, so have we been spectators in the multiple stories documenting vulnerabilities and the and their exploitation. In one such instance, 
A spoofed radio signal was used to activate 156 emergency sirens in Texas. Separately, a Jewish teenager was recently arrested for making bomb threats to Jewish institutions in the United States, wherein one of the methods that he used to obfuscate his activity was the hacking of a Wi-Fi network. And just yesterday in my reading, a vulnerability was identified and patched by Hyundai where an insecure Wi-Fi connection could be used and leveraged and exploited to capture account credentials facilitating potential malicious actors' location of the vehicle, unlocking of the doors, and even remote start of the engine. This same article noted that in 2015, Chrysler also identified a vulnerability in their infotainment system, which allowed attackers to remotely take control of vehicle steering and braking. And the FBI has published a number of different private industry notes and fla uh, flash messages, public service announcements, talking about and highlighting different facets of some of these same threats. Unnamed aerial uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, infrastructure automation, and even now the flying car, as noted in the New York Times article two days ago, advancements and the associated threats that come with them continue to build on each other and catapult us into the future. In this future, as we become more and more globally connected by the growing number of mobile devices in all sectors of our lives and faster, more robust 5G networks prepare to come online, the potential attack plane increases with an alarming acceleration. Our generation faces an incessant global cyber threat. As our best and brightest minds engage in tech, not technological wizardry, leapfrogging one advancement after another, their counterparts not only keep pace, but frequently generate compromise opportunities on a scale of speed, volume, and breadth far too challenging for any one private organization, institution to overcome. Recognizing the truth that the good guys, and that's all of us in this room, have to think out of the box and generate new strategies to successfully overcome the relentless flood of potential attack vectors employed by actors with nefarious intent. The expansive nature of this perpetual threat demonstrates not only continued growth, but adept evolution, resulting in a continually changing battlefield. A whole of nation approach is required to succeed under these circumstances. Actors who seek to identify, develop, and exploit digital vulnerabilities come in many shapes and sizes. There are nation states who are growing more sophisticated and more aggressive in their intrusion activities as they look for opportunities to exercise information from the networks, our networks, and the networks of their adversaries. International and multinational organized groups working to steal information to make money via complicated criminal schemes or simply by selling the data to the highest bidder. Ransomware specialists who extort victims by holding their data and or their system access hostage. Hacktivists and terrorists who utilize network intrusion tactics to promote a political, philosophical, or ideological message or agenda. Finally, there are insiders who take the form of employees or contractors whose motivation might lead them to bypass otherwise strong defenses against external outside threats to, pen to penetration of a network and uh, use that access to then penetrate the network from the inside. Insiders can be motivated by personal grudges, ideological beliefs, and even money. What do these actors want? The following two statistics highlight one of the, some of the primary drivers of risk faced by corporate America. In the 2016 DBIR report, uh, there was an approximation of 89% of breaches that had a financial or espionage motivation behind the breaches. And then 90% of cyber espionage breaches captured trade secrets or proprietary data. So financial gain is still one of the most powerful motivators of actors in cyber intrusions but it's not the only one, and certainly not the most concerning. Information, access, and advantage. The attacks we are describing impact not just the victim's infrastructure, they harm our employees, they harm our customers, our reputation, our economy, our sense of security, and our basic freedoms we are so accustomed to in this great country. These intangible costs manifest themselves in the suffering of victims. Even the concept of data theft is no longer a simple equation of monetizing the contraband. We now focus on corruption of data, denial of access to data that could potentially lead to inaccurate hospital records or the inability to access those hospital records. In prior years, an intrusion may be embarrassing, 
In the environment we find ourselves in today, an intrusion has the ability to be a catastrophic event, shutting a business down. How do these actors ply their trade? Many vulnerabilities are available for hackers to exploit. However, human beings are still one of the most frequent vulnerabilities. Through social engineering, actors gain access to legitimate credentials, which they then can elevate, use to elevate privileges within an establish, to establish a persistent persistence on a network. Convincing someone to divulge critical access information on a social networking website, representing themselves as a trusted friend, colleague, or associate, and even recruiting a disgruntled employee or, act, or a person with access in the hopes of making money on the side. Humans remain one of the weakest links in our defense. Again, uh, studies have shown 63% of confirmed data breaches involve weak, default, or stolen passwords. So we must invest in training and preparing our workforce to better prepare them to combat these threats. No locale, industry, or organization is bulletproof when it comes to compromise of data. There are things we can do to prepare for and mitigate against the threat. There are many lists of best practices out there. I'll touch on a few things that are important. Update and patch our systems. The weakest link theory is prevalent in cybersecurity. If your system is vulnerable, was vulnerable a year ago and you haven't patched that vulnerability, then it's still vulnerable today. Statistically, patching the 10 or fewer known vulnerabilities, and this depends on the study that you look at as to how many there are, the 10 or fewer known vulnerabilities will mitigate nearly 85% of exploit traffic. Build security into your network architecture. Segregate critical corporate functions behind layers of additional defensive and preventive measures, protecting them from outward-facing services. Establish and maintain redundancy in our networks, refreshing backups on a regular basis. Secure our users. Minimize remote access, establish strong authentication, and monitor the access. Secure our network activity, establish a baseline for acceptable use on the network, and then whitelist services and applications to ensure compliance. Use encryption appropriately to harden data exploitation, even if it is stolen. Most importantly, educate your staff regarding the threats and risks that they face to build the strongest human shield possible. Also, sharing information amongst corporate and government partners to fully identify actor tradecraft is a hallmark of solid risk reduction. We can't stop every attack, but we can, with collaboration, we can reduce the available attack plane. And the FBI has an active role in that. Finally, sharing, uh, finally, having a response plan and a mitigation plan, practicing that response and mitigation plan, and establishing strong contacts with your local FBI partners in your geographic region well in advance of an incident. So what are we doing? What are we in the FBI doing? Recognizing cyber actors have no boundaries, we've restructured how we assign cyber work in the FBI. We have established a better capability to leverage the expertise and the cyber, cyber capabilities, the most capable resources that we have against the most significant threats. We have created quick response teams distributed throughout the country who are capable of traveling around the world on a moment's notice to physically be present at the site of a significant intrusion, even, even uh, at an intrusion event when necessary. We are forward deploying technically proficient, technically capable investigators around the globe to better position themselves to work with our partners globally. And we are also working closer with partners in the federal, state, and municipal agencies to better prepare all of us in our effort to respond. What is it that we need from you? What do we need from our partners? Talk to us and get to know us by integrating us into your response planning. To do all of these things, we need to collaborate. We need partnership. We all face challenges in this fight. Not a single one of us can accomplish this alone. With that in mind, we need to have an established relationship before an incident happens. This will enhance our ability to respond during time of an attack and assist victims with becoming whole again. You are the front lines in this fight. We need the suspicious information you observe via well-placed eyes and ears in those critical places, and this is crucial to success. So talk to your local FBI counterparts. We have a vested interest in protecting our engagement with any victim and every victim. We will work very hard to ensure that any information you provide to us is protected to avoid re-victimizing your company. 
We understand the concerns about competitive advantage, disrupting operations, and the, the liability that comes with a potential intrusion. We will work with any victim to the best of our ability to minimize the disruption your, to your business and employees. We will protect your privacy and we will not share your sensitive data. We always provide you with the most accurate assessment of what we will do with your data to enable your risk benefit decision making process in determining what information that you can give us. So what does the future look like? We are working diligently to provide deterrence, to prevent attacks, and to better respond. By holding accountable those responsible for cyber crimes, we will work to change the actor's calculus when considering an attack on an American network. Through indictment, prosecution, sanctions, or publicity, we are working hard to make sure the people on the other end of the keyboards know that if you target our citizens or an American company, you will pay a price. We are continually working to get better in our fight against cyber threats. As part of this fight, we need to be more predictive and less reactive, building better relationships and establishing more collaboration, facilitating effective information sharing and alliance building, and refining best practices. All of these are symbols of future success, and the FBI will continue to develop in each of these areas. Agility and innovation, we must establish the most robust capability in advance of an attack to ensure we are agile enough to respond at a moment's notice, and more importantly, plugged in enough to see when we need to exercise that agility. Additionally, we must continuously innovate in our approaches to combating the cyber threat. Success is not defined by defeating every adversary or staying ahead of each threat. To indicate other eyes would be presumptuous. However, working together, we can ensure we are best postured and prepared to respond to any attack. Our future depends on effective relationships, and in this venue, we are truly one team, all of us together. Thank you, and enjoy the summit.